Occupational English Test. Listening Test. This test has three parts. In each part you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a GP talking to a patient called Mrs. Wright. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Afternoon, Mrs. Wright. I'm Dr. Kildare. Now, unfortunately, your usual GP is away today, so I'm going to help you if that's okay. That's fine. Thank you for seeing me. Okay, so uh, I've got some notes, but it'd be helpful if you could tell me, in your own words, about the problems you've been having. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Grimmett asked me to come back and check in about my foot. I've had gout, you see. Okay, so just remind me, what, what happened with your gout? Well, the first time was late last year, about two or three months ago. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Grimmett had to treat me at home. It was pretty bad. I could hardly walk. Oh. We used steroids at the end to get a hold of it. I had the prednisone tablets, uh, 30 milligrams for five days. Right. All the blood tests showed that I had the tendency to gout from crystals, so Dr. Grimmett gave me the allopurinol, trying to calm that down longer term. The doctor said to contact the clinic if it got worse, or come back around now just to check in. Right. Uh, so we haven't seen you. Is that a good sign? Well, I had... Um, it, was, it was a good job I had the repeat prescription for steroids, because just after Christmas I had a bit of a flare-up again. Ah. Um, I, I suppose I was eating a bit too much rich food and probably had more to drink than normal. But I have been watching it a bit. Mm. Um, the doctor recommended I drink more water. Uh, he said eight glasses, a couple of liters. And I've been trying, but it's a lot, you know, and I'm busy. So I don't think I drink more than six glasses through the day. Um, but it's definitely more than before. Right. Well, that, that's really good to hear. W water can definitely help. So it's great that you're keeping that up. Sorry, do you mind just describing where the swelling was when you had it? Yeah, sure. Um, well, both times it started down the side, kind of at the base of the second toe on my left foot, mm. there. And then the whole foot swelled up across my smaller toes to the outside of my foot. Ah, I see. And both times I started getting a lot of pain and it was all kind of spreading down from that area and it went across the toes and started swelling up quite badly, really hot and inflamed. But it never goes to the big toe. Mm. So, the second time, it never swelled up quite as bad as it did before, but I think I caught it in time when I went and got the steroid tablets from the chemist. Ah, good. So, how long did it take to settle down once you started the tablets? It was a lot better than last time. I went straight back down within a week, so it was a lot better. Right, and, and when it settled down completely, is, is it back to normal? No, it's never been back to normal. Um, I still have pain on that second toe where it always was right from the start, um, mm. and I've still got it now. Right, and, and how are you getting on with the allopurinol? Uh, yes, it seems to be better. Um, I don't have any problems with it. I'm taking them okay, mm. but like I say, that second toe is still giving me a little bit of a problem. Mm, I see. At the time, the doctor actually wondered if it might be a stress fracture, mm. um, but I had a foot x-ray and, and that was clear. But I just think it's a bit unusual that it's still sore, mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, everything points to gout, and the blood test confirmed that was the most likely thing, mm -hmm. but 
that toe, it isn't the usual joint, as you know, for gout. It's usually the big joint, isn't it? Yes, that's right. The big toe is typical. But when I had the flare-up, the steroids really helped quite quickly. I stopped taking painkillers after two days at most. Mm. Um, and I feel like it's, it's less severe and we've got a hold of it better. So I guess that means the allopurinol is helping, right? Y yes, I think so. So I'm still quite keen to carry on with that tap. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a physician talking to a patient called Brandon McNally. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Have seated. May I know your problem? Well, I'm a patient with hypertension, chronic intermittent bipedal edema, and recurrent leg venous ulcers. I had a vascular surgery for non-healing right ankle stasis ulcer. I have a serious concern today that I had a low-grade fever of 100.2 early this morning. Otherwise, everything was well. The thing is, I was not even aware of the fever. I do have some ankle pain, worse on the right than the left. OK, what's your age? 52, Doctor. Do you drink or smoke? No, Doctor. Are you getting nausea, vomiting or diarrhoea? No, Doctor. May I know your previous illness history? Well, hypertension, exploratory laparotomy in 2016 for abdominal obstruction, cholecystectomy in 2017. Chronic intermittent bipedal edema, venous insufficiency, chronic recurrent stasis ulcers. What medications are you taking? Primaxin, daptomycin, clonidine, furosemide, potassium chloride, lisinopril, metoprolol, renitidine, cholase, amlodipine, zinc sulfate, lortab, multivitamins with minerals. Are you allergic to any medicine? No, doctor. Well, the physical examination shows heart rate 73, respiratory rate 20, blood pressure 104 over 67, temperature 98.3, and oxygen saturation 92% on room air. There is hyperpigmentation involving distal calf on both legs. There is an open wound on the right medial malleolar area measuring 9 by 5 centimeters with minimal serous drainage. Peri wound is hyperpigmentated with a hint of erythema extending proximally to the medial aspect, distal third of the right lower leg. There is warmth but minimal tenderness on palpation of this area. There is also a wound on the right lateral malleolar area measuring 4 by 3 centimeters. Another open wound on the left medial malleolar area measuring 7 by 4 centimeters. Wound edges are poorly defined. Laboratory results show white blood cell count is 5.8 with 64% neutrophils, H and H 11.3 over 33.8, and platelet count 176,000, BUN and creatine 9.2 over 0 0.52, albumin 3.6, AST 25, ALT 9. Alkfos, 87, and total bilirubin, 0 0.6. Chest X-ray shows chronic bibascular subsegmental atelic stasis, likely related to elevated hemidiaphragm, secondary to chronic ileus. No absolute findings. You have multiple previous wound cultures, positive for pseudomonas, enterococcus, and stenotrophomonas, fevers, right leg, ankle cellulitis, 
chronic recurrent bilateral ankle venous ulcers, hypertension. I am ordering two sets of blood cultures, injection with daptomycin and primaxin 4. I am ordering an MRI of the right ankle to check for underlying osteomyelitis, follow-up results of wound cultures, additional treatment and medications are upon follow-up. That is the end of part A, now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. Question 25. You hear a trainee doctor discussing a patient diagnosis with a tutor. Now read the question. Let's have a quick chat about the diagnosis for Janine in Ward 2. Yeah, I, I was a bit unsure about that one. Um, because it's a young patient, it's quite... It's not going to be diverticulitis or... Well, it's possible, but she is young, so... Yeah, it's unlikely. So, what do you think? What else could it be? What else happens in the bowel? Something common. Think about common things. Bilateral lower abdominal pain? Uh, because it's like radiating into the back? Yeah, something very much, much more common than that. Gastroenterological? Yeah. Um, I can't think. Possibly related to diet? Celiac disease? Perhaps, but there's not a lot of other symptoms pointing to that. What else would give you discomfort in the bowel? Lower abdominal pain? Mm, I suppose if they're just constipated. Right, yeah, constipation. Question 26. You hear a discussion between two doctors on agents used in vaccines. Now read the question. Doctor, what is an adjuvant and why are adjuvants added to vaccines? Well, an adjuvant is used in vaccines to create a stronger immune response in patients. Certain vaccines made from dead or weakened germs contain naturally obtained adjuvants and help the human body produce a strong protective immune response. These vaccines often must be made with adjuvants to ensure the body produces an immune response strong enough to protect the patient from the germ he or she is being vaccinated against. In the U.S., Monophosphoryl lipid A and aluminum are used as adjuvants in the vaccines. 
monophosphorylipid A has been used as an ingredient since 2009 in the vaccine called Cerverix. Aluminum salts or gels are used as ingredients in vaccines since 1930. However, most vaccines developed today include just small components of germs, such as their proteins, rather than the entire virus or bacteria. Question 27. You hear a discussion about possible causes of arthritis. Now read the question. Hello doctor, can you tell me what are the possible causes of arthritis? Osteoarthritis is associated with cartilage damage. Genetic conditions are thought to play a role in osteoarthritis. Age alone is no longer seen as the cause of osteoarthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease that develops as the immune system malfunctions and attacks the body's own tissues. Gout develops when excessive uric acid accumulates in the body and crystals are deposited in the joints. Reactive arthritis causes joints to become inflamed as a result of an infection that triggers the immune system. Usually, this condition resolves. Question 28. You hear the announcement of a new drug, Avastin used in colon cancer treatment. Now read the question. A milestone in cancer treatment. Cut, burn, and poison is the expression that describes the traditional three steps involved in the cancer treatment. Specifically, the expression means to cut out the growth of the cancer tumor, burn the carcinogenic cells with radiation, and poison those that remain with chemotherapy drugs. Interestingly, a young doctor from the U.S. proposed another method to treat cancer about 30 years ago. He thought that abandoning the blood supply to cancer tumors could block their growth, but many scientists dismissed this concept for a long period. However, last month, the Food and Drug Administration of the U.S. approved the drug called Avastin that works the way he proposed. Although the drug does not cure the cancer, it increases the lifespan of the patient with colon cancer. Avastin is a genetically engineered protein that connects with the protein in the human body that promotes the growth of the blood vessels. The protein, also known as vascular endothelial growth factor, intervenes with the supply of blood to cancer and starves the cancer cells. Avastin targets the weak places of cancer cells, though it does not damage normal tissue. Whereas chemotherapy kills cancer cells, and also the other normal cells resulting in infections along with stomach and intestinal problems. There are also other drugs being tested to investigate whether they can stop the formation of blood vessels. In the past two years, Avastin is one of three new drugs approved for colon cancer. Question 29. You hear a trainee nurse asking his senior colleague about the use of anti-embolism socks for a patient. Now read the question. I noticed that Mrs. Jones isn't wearing the usual anti-embolism socks, but I didn't want to ask her why not, because she was asleep. Is it because her legs are swollen? Well, sometimes we don't recommend the socks if there's severe swelling with edema, but that's not the case here. Mrs. Jones was actually given them initially on admission last night, but she told us this morning that her lower legs were feeling numb. She described it as having no feeling. Until we've checked out the reason for that, for example, it could be an underlying condition which could damage her arterial circulation. We're reducing the risk of thrombosis by pharmacological means. Oh, I see. Question 30.
Question 30. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse on different stages of gout. Now read the question. Hello doctor. What are the different stages of gout? Well, there are various stages through which gout progresses. In the asymptomatic hyperuricemia stage, the person will elevated uric acid levels without any outward symptoms. The acute gout stage occurs when the urate crystals suddenly cause inflammation and intense pain. This condition is also called flare that can be triggered by alcohol and drug usage, stressful events, and due to cold weather. The intracritical gout is the period further urate crystals are being deposited in tissue. The main difference between gout and pseudogout is that the joints are irritated by calcium phosphate crystals instead of urate crystals. Chronic tophaceous gout is the most debilitating stage. Permanent damage might have occurred in the kidneys and joints. The patient can also develop tophi, big lumps of urate crystals in joints of the fingers. Pseudogout is the condition that is confused with gout. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear a doctor briefing his staff about the pathology report. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Hello doctor, will you please explain to me about the type of information included in a pathology report? Well, often a pathology report of surgical specimens is complex and very long. These are divided into many subheadings. The general information includes the name of the patient, the medical report number, the date of the biopsy or surgery and the unique number of the specimen that is assigned in the lab. The next set of information often contains patient information provided by the doctor who resected the tissue sample. This information includes the special requests made to the pathologist and the medical history. For instance, if a lymph node sample is being resected from a patient with cancer in another organ, the doctor will indicate the type of the original cancer.
This is useful in guiding the pathologist's selection of special tests that may be required to assess if any cancer in that lymph node is a metastasis from the original cancer or else a new cancer that started in the lymph node. Gross description is the next part of the information. Here, the term gross means the detail seen without using a microscope by simply looking at it and feeling the tissue sample and measuring. In the case of a small biopsy, the gross description would be a few sentences listing its colour, size and consistency. Gross description would also include the number of tissue containing cassettes submitted for biopsy. However, in the case of a larger biopsy or tissue specimen, for instance a mastectomy for breast cancer, this will have lengthy gross descriptions including the size of the entire piece of tissue, size of the cancer tumour, how close the cancer tumour is to the nearest surgical margin of the specimen, how many lymph nodes were detected in the underarm area and the particulars of the non-cancer tissues. A note of where tissue was taken from is also included. The gross description is very short for cryptology specimens. That usually notes the number of smears or slides made by the doctor. If the specimen is a body fluid, its volume and colour are indicated. Microscopic description will include details such as the appearance of cancer cells, how these cells are arranged together and the extent of invasion to the nearby tissue in the specimen. Results of any other investigations made such as flow cryptometry, histochemical etc. may be indicated in the microscopic description or in an exclusive section. Diagnosis is the most significant part of the pathology report. Although this is the bottom line of the pathology, this section can be mentioned at the top or bottom of the report. The doctor relies on this final diagnosis information to decide on the best treatment methodologies. In case the diagnosis is made for a cancer tumour, this section will indicate the exact type of cancer and will include the grade of cancer. Once the final diagnosis is complete, the pathologist may want to include any additional notes for the doctors taking care of the patient. Often this comment section is used to recommend further diagnosis or to clarify a concern. Now look at extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear the discussion of a physician with junior doctors on pericarditis. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello everyone. Now, I'm going to explain to you something about pericarditis. The infection or inflammation that occurs in the pericardium is called pericarditis. 
Inflammation of the pericardial layers arises when the membrane gets thickened and the layers rub against each other. During such a condition, the increase in the fluid volume in the pericardial sac results in compression of the heart, which subsequently affects the functioning ability of the heart. Chest pain is the main symptom of pericarditis, which is normally not considered as a life-threatening condition, and patients may become normal in a few days or weeks. However, in certain cases, the symptoms may last for several months. It is a relatively common heart condition, and around 5% of patients with severe chest pain are diagnosed as pericarditis. Moreover, it is very common in men than in women. It affects people of all ages, but mostly occurs in young adults. Based on the symptoms and causes, pericarditis is categorized into many types. Pericarditis based on symptoms Acute pericarditis occurs when chest pain develops suddenly, radiating to the neck, shoulders and back. The pain increases during when breathing in or inspiration and while lying down. However, it decreases while sitting. The symptoms may last for less than three months and may get resolved in a few days with appropriate treatment. Pericarditis may be idiopathic or due to viral or bacterial infection, cardiac arrest, metabolic disorders or a blunt injury. The condition is also caused by radiation toxins, toxins, trauma or as a side effect of certain drugs. Chronic pericarditis at times persists for a long period and the symptoms last longer than three to six months. In such cases, the patient may not have the chest pain but may experience tiredness, shortness of breath and coughing. Chronic pericarditis is believed to be the result of certain autoimmune disorders such as lupus, scleroderma and rheumatoid arthritis, where the antibodies produced by the body attack its own cells and tissues. Pericarditis based on causes Constrictive pericarditis occurs when the pericarditis is associated with a thickening or scarring of the pericardial layers. This starts constricting the heart within the thoracic cavity, which in turn controls its functioning. Pericardial effusion. In a normal individual, the pericardial cavity is filled with about 20 to 50 milliliters of fluid. At times, in patients with specific medical conditions such as severe hypothyroidism or kidney failure, or in patients who have undergone invasive cardiac procedures, there may be a gradual accumulation of fluid within the pericardial cavity, which may often be asymptomatic until the surrounding structures start getting compressed. In such cases, symptoms related to such compressions such as dyspnea, nausea, fullness of the abdomen may manifest. Cardiac tamponade is caused when persistent pericardial effusion causes the pericardial fluid volume to increase up to 80 milliliters or even 200 milliliters, which can lead to malfunction of the pericardium. Therefore, this condition has to be treated as an emergency. Viral pericarditis Viruses that can cause viral pericarditis include Coxsackie viruses, influenza virus, agents of viral enteritis, human immunodeficiency virus, and echovirus. Upon onset of this condition, the early symptom can be the infection in the upper airways. This kind of pericarditis is simple and can be handled as an outpatient procedure. Prurulent pericarditis is a rare disease caused by aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. Recent studies show that procedures such as surgery in the chest region, hemodialysis, immunosuppression and chemotherapy are dominant causes that result in this type of pericarditis. Tuberculosis pericarditis is also seen in a very minor percentage of patients having pulmonary tuberculosis. HIV patients are at a high risk of tuberculosis pericarditis. There is a gradual progression of symptoms such as night sweats, dyspnea, fever and chill but any suspected patient should be given emergency treatment. Radiation pericarditis is caused due to recent mediastinal radiation at any time from weeks to months after the exposure. Malignancy pericarditis is mainly caused by metastatic disease. It is common in metastatized bronchogenic or breast carcinoma, Hodgkin's disease and lymphoma. However, it is rare in primary mesothelioma and angiosarcoma. Traumatic pericarditis Blunt or sharp trauma causes traumatic pericarditis. Invasive cardiac procedures may also cause this type of pericarditis, which includes cardiac diagnostic catheterization and electrophysiological ablation procedure.
That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test.